How's everybody doing? Matt Barry here, ESPN College Football YouTube channel with your week six preview. And there's a lot of times when you look at a slate and you look at a schedule and a storyline or a theme, something just kind of sticks out and stands out and jumps off the page and said that that's what this week is going to be all about. This is what's going to define this particular week in college football. And for me, week six, a little bit of a backstory for you. Every Wednesday morning, I hop on uh, Sirius XM radio, ESPNU, it's channel 84. And I hop on with our guy, Dusty Dvorak, who does work with us at ESPN, calls college football games, and Danny Cannell, uh, used to work at ESPN, does a lot of college football work around the country. And they do a thing on Wednesday where I hop on every morning and I pick a song. And I pick kind of a theme song, kind of my walk-up song uh, for what I'm going to use to discuss uh, with, with Dusty and Danny uh, for the week that kind of was and, and, and more of a look at like we're doing here on week six. And I knew what I wanted to use as a theme this week. So I ended up settling on that old Julie Andrews song, Getting to Know You. I'm not going to sing it because I'll look like an idiot, but you, you know what I mean? Getting to know you, getting to know all about you. And so they were kind of intrigued. They're like, well, Matt, why did you choose this Julie Andrews song, Getting to Know You? And I said, well, guys, it's simple. This week in college football, above all else to this point of the season, as we embark here on October in week six, it is a get to know you with a lot of these teams. Because at this point of the season, with schedules and everything that these, these teams have played, we, we don't really know a lot about them. We know that they're good. We know that they can score points. We know that they've got a good quarterback. We know that the coach is a good fit. We know all of the, the treetop storylines, but what do we really know? And so that's how I'm going to theme this week's preview. And I'm going to start at noon Eastern ESPN, Tennessee and LSU. To me, this is a great example of what we're talking about and getting to know you. Tennessee's ranked eighth in the country. We know that. We know that Hendon Hooker probably won the September Heisman. We know that. We also know that Josh Heupel in year two in Knoxville has been a really good fit. Tree tops. Like I said, we know all of that about Tennessee. What we don't know is how they're going to set up against a really good SEC defense on the road at noon Eastern in a hostile place like Baton Rouge. They've played Ball State. They've played Pitt, which at the time looked like a good win. Then Pitt goes and loses to Georgia Tech in week five. So that win's not as, as good as it appeared to be. They have played Akron. Then they played Florida. When Florida was ranked, they beat them 38-33. Florida came back, had a chance at an onside kick to get back into that game. But that's the schedule to this point. Ball State, Pitt, Akron, Florida. Now they go to LSU in a hostile environment, like I said, as a top 10 team with a lot of people saying and treating them like a top 10 team. Now, I'm not saying they're not. I think Hendon Hooker has been remarkable. I think Josh Heupel and this offense has been remarkable. One of their starting receivers, game time decision, we still don't know if he's going to play yet, which would be a big loss for Tennessee if Tillman can't play. But this is a moment for Tennessee to really show us who they are. Conversely, Brian Kelly, they are an extra blocked point away against Florida State from, from going to overtime and potentially being 5-0. and oh. And so I really, really believe we are going to get to know Tennessee. We're going to get to know who they are. We're going to get to know if this is a legitimate threat to Georgia and the SEC East. Because I'll tell you this, what we saw out of Georgia a week ago against Missouri, what we saw kind of the week before against Kent State, they haven't. They haven't been hitting on all cylinders. They just haven't been what we thought uh, Georgia would be against opponents like Missouri and Kent State. So this is that opportunity for Tennessee and the volunteers to come out and say, hey, you know what? This is what we are. This is who we are. We are a legitimate threat to Georgia in the SEC. So get to know you, Team 1, Tennessee, 4-0 to start the season, ranked in the top 10, head to Baton Rouge, can they get it done uh, against the Tigers who are four and one and feeling pretty good about themselves? We'll find out Saturday. Now the second team and game and program we're going to get to know over the weekend is going to get nationally known because for the first time in school history, college game day is making an appearance to Lawrence. 
uh, for the Kansas TCU game. Uh, we should probably send a thank you card to Texas A&M for losing the way that they did, because I, I still believe game day might have gone to Alabama and Texas A&M for the, the much hyped October 8th, Jimbo Fisher versus Nick Saban matchup, but they didn't. So now we have TCU and Kansas. We have this game to talk about because everybody is going to get to know who Kansas is on a national scale uh, because of the college game, day appearance. But again, when you look at their schedule, Kansas had a great win against West Virginia when they were down 14, nothing that a nice win against Iowa state. But do we really know, do we really know if Kansas is the type of team that can go through the meat of their big 12 schedule and compete for a conference championship? We're going to find out because Max Duggan, Sonny Dykes in that TCU offense has been so good to start the season. And the defense for Kansas, that's kind of a one question mark. We know Jalen Daniels, the quarterback, is a great story. He's been great this season. He's been fun to watch. He's adapted to what Lance Leipold and that staff has wanted to do offensively. So we know Kansas's offense. The defense is going to get their first test this weekend. We're going to get to know the Kansas defense right away because they got Max Duggan, TCU, and that offense coming in. What Duggan did a week ago counted for six touchdowns in a win against Oklahoma, which, by the way, a win against Oklahoma and a defensive-minded head coach in Brent Venables. They went out there last week. It was a five touchdowns for Max Duggan. By the way, five or six touchdowns accounted for. They couldn't be stopped, and Oklahoma could not stop them. And again, that's where they hang their hat on if you're Brent Venables in Oklahoma is the defense. And so TCU is the perfect test for everybody to get to know Kansas. I want to buy in. I think this story is so good. Kansas ranked, or they're 5-0 and for the first time since 2009. They get college game. They Don't you just want to buy in to everything going on in Lawrence? This is another opportunity. I'm telling you, if they get by TCU, TCU is ranked 17th, Kansas is 19th. By the way, TCU is a seven-point favorite at Kansas. Vegas seems to not buy in to the Jayhawks and what they're doing defensively, but we're going to get to know them right away. One, because naturally when game day comes to town, they do such a good job on local features and everything in between, but for the game, this is going to be fun to watch Kansas TCU getting to know the Jayhawks. Does the story continue for Kansas? And this is one of those games. Also one of those matchups where Kansas has been the darling but think about this for TCU. I'd said it on the uh, recap a couple of days ago on Sunday, Bloody Sunday, which, by the way, check out on the ESPN College Football YouTube channel, that the Big 12 is wide open. There are so many teams and games left to play that are going to decide this conference. If TCU wins, they're going to find themselves in the top 15. They're going to find themselves at 5-0 and on the season. And they're going to find themselves believing that along with Oklahoma being out of it, that Red River game between Texas and Oklahoma all but eliminates one of those teams. TCU keeps winning, or conversely, if Kansas keeps winning, the end of the Big 12 season is going to be remarkable. So get to know Kansas part one, but TCU with an asterisk here on the road against the darling of college football with college game day coming to town. So here's a team that's interesting because of the conference that they play in the coach that they have in the season that they started off with. UCLA might be the quietest 5-0 team in the country. Their schedule at the beginning of the season was absolutely brutal. Now, I know you can only play the games on your schedule, but listed of these first four games that they had leading into the Washington game, Bowling Green, Alabama State, South Alabama, Colorado. That was all pre-Washington who was 15th, Michael Penix Jr., uh, one of the good early storylines in the conference. But that's, that's not that really good of a schedule. Now they get by Washington and win 40-32. to 32. Now they get Utah. Now they get the defending conference champions, and that's how we're going to get to know UCLA. Right now, Dorian Thompson-Robinson, seems like he's been there for a decade, by the way. He has mastered the Chip Kelly offense. He's had plenty of time with him. Chip's in year five in UCLA. DTR seems like he's in year 10, but he's got a good grasp of what Chip's trying to do. Add to that, Zach Charbonnet, his second year in the UCLA system after transferring in from Michigan. This is a quiet 5-0 team. And if you go and you beat 
Utah, the defending Pac-12 champs, who we know who Utah is. We know exactly who they are. They run the ball, Davion Thomas, Cam Rising. They hit you in the mouth defensively, and they're going to play with you for all four quarters. We know what they can do. It's UCLA that is really, really intriguing. I had Roddy Jones on SportsCenter with me on Wednesday, and we were kind of talking about keeping this get-to-know theme. And I asked him, I said, look, in the pecking order of the Pac-12, where would you rank UCLA, Utah, USC, and Oregon? USC ranks the highest at ninth. Uh, Oregon's bounced back after the embarrassment to Georgia. And he said, look, Matt, I'd, I'd keep Utah at the top, which I would agree with. They're the defending champion. Their only loss is at the Swamp Week 1. But then he'd put UCLA over USC. And that's telling to me because UCLA on both sides of the ball up front is good. They're solid. They'll hit you in the mouth. They're going to play you well up front, but they're going to be very tough to defend on de- on offense if you're the defense. And so if, it's a big if, because I still think Utah is going to win this game. I think they're just a better football team. But there's always that team every single year that comes out of nowhere, gets into the conversation of a conference championship, and then maybe a playoff. Too early for a playoff discussion to UCLA. But you will, without any doubt, get to know the UCLA Bruins this week because they've got the defending Pac-12 champs in Utah, the standard with which this conference is set. And so keep an eye on UCLA, Utah. That to me might be my most uh, favorite uh, get to know game. Cause I just, I, I want to see UCLA in the real UCLA after this game, you'll know exactly who they are. All right. Now they get to know you game out of the Pac-12 to the ACC. And Again, this is one of those weeks that writes itself because NC State coming off the loss to Clemson where the offense the second half, Devin Leary just sputtered, give Clemson's defense credit. And then Florida State, who was kind of the feel-good feel good team uh, going into last week against Wake Forest, and they get the loss to Sam Hartman and, and the Demon Deeks, their first of the year. So, so here we have both NC State coming off their first loss of the year, Florida State coming off their first loss of the year, who are they when they have to bounce back? Because you can't afford another loss in conference this early in the season and still have an opportunity to win your division and then go play for the conference championship. And so I am really interested in getting to know both of these teams after their first setback of the year. Because when you're winning, everything's great. When you're winning, everybody's telling you how great you are. When you're winning, everyone's saying Mike Norvell's got this thing turned around, Jordan Travis, Florida State's back recruiting and all this. And then when you lose, you've got to be able to push that aside and stay within the season. And so how can the Seminoles bounce back against a team in NC State where Florida State's got to go on the road to Carter Finley? But NC State was another one of those teams. They had everybody coming back. They have a really, really good defense. Leary was one of the top rated quarterbacks coming in. Devin Carter's a huge tight end. They are a huge receiver. They are Thomas is a nice player, but then they go and beat, get beat against Clemson. It couldn't move the ball in the second half. And so two teams, one that had risen to expectations in Florida state coming off a loss, one that has expectations at NC state coming off a loss to Clemson. Both of these teams after their first loss, getting to know which one is going to be able to bounce back get their season back on track. This is a sneaky, sneaky good game. ACC Network, 8 p.m. Eastern, Florida State and NC State. The get-to-know here is bouncing back from the first loss of the season. Now, this isn't really a a get-to-know type game in that we know who Alabama is. We don't know, however, if Bryce Young is going to play yet at that sprained AC joint. We also know the offseason spat between Nick Saban, who said Texas A&M, A&M bought all of their recruits. We know Jimbo Fisher responded. It was quite a visceral response. People in college football lit up over that exchange. And everybody circled October 8th on their calendar as the must-watch college football game of the year. Texas A&M has since lost to Appalachian State. They could have lost to Arkansas. However, they didn't. So that's fine. A a win is a win is a win. But then they go and get beat down last week against Mississippi State. So now this game went from must-see because of the clash between Jimbo Fisher to Alabama 
likely blowing the doors off AM, giving them their third loss of the season. Not only did AM have to contend with the fact that Zach Calzada and the Aggies beat Alabama a year ago for that revenge factor, you had all the accusations in the back and forth. And only one team comes in here playing good football, and it's Alabama. So we're not getting to know anything that we didn't think we'd know about Alabama AM. I think we wanted this game to be bigger. It's just not because of circumstances AM can't control, which is uh, playing good football at this point. But I don't even think if Bryce Young's out, if it's Jalen Milrow, I think it's going to be the same as it ever was. The one thing we will know, because I know Will Anderson Jr., in my mind, best football player in the country. I know he said in the offseason when, when that stuff came out about uh, what Jimbo accused Saban of, and they asked Will Anderson Jr. about it. It was at media days, preseason, whatever. He said, we'll settle it October 8th. I think the only thing that we will get to know is how badly – Alabama wants payback against Texas A&M from last year's loss alone. Add in everything else. This is on prime time television, CBS. I mean, it's the whole, whole works. This to me is the only game that we're not, again, we're going to get to know UCLA. We're going to get to know Kansas. We're going to get to know Tennessee. We're also going to get to know how badly Alabama hangs on to grudges. Cause that's the only thing making this game. Great. Is it, you got a pissed off Alabama you got to beat up Texas A&M. This thing could get bad. Let me check the, the point spread as of taping on this game. 24 points. Vegas even thinks it's going to be a blowout. But just for the sideshow of this one, Alabama, A&M, the coaching mouth off game, Jimbo versus Nick Saban. This one's going to be a fun one to watch. All right, so on Sunday, Bloody Sunday, and we may have talked about it on, on my recap with Fine Bomb, which again, ESPN College Football YouTube channel, we talked about Paul Christ uh, potentially being the next guy out uh, midseason. It, sure enough, I think hours after we taped both of those shows, it ended up happening. Paul Christ out at Wisconsin, uh, Jim Leonard in, the defensive coordinator. He is going to be the interim coach for the remainder of the season. And there's been a lot of talk about that about this firing this week, just because of how good Paul Christ was record wise for Wisconsin. And that's true. He was great for Wisconsin. They competed in the big 10 West the first few years. He's been to New York six bowls. He, he had Wisconsin in a perfect spot. I had always said uh, with fit, you know, there, there are certain coaches and maybe I said this uh, recently in the, in the show that we were taping that there are some coaches who fit the program where they coach. So Paul Chris is from Madison. He's a Wisconsin guy. He was exactly what Wisconsin needed at the time. But starting two and three was not good for athletic director Chris McIntosh, and he decided to let him go. Now he's 67 and 26 at his alma mater. He won 72% of his games. And nowadays, that can get you fired in college football if they haven't seen the growth in the jump that they want to. So they're giving Jimmy Leonard, the defense coordinator, an opportunity. It's really, look, at the end of the day, an interim coach and an interim coach like Jim Leonard is a good time for the Badgers to figure out if Leonard's the guy. He, too, played at Wisconsin. He's a younger, energetic coach uh, that finds a way to get the most out of his defense. It's just been that way for a long time with him as their defensive coordinator. Wisconsin just plays good, hard-nosed defense. And I think nowadays, when you have a younger coach in this new era of NIL, transfer portal, social media, all this other stuff that goes along with, with college coaching, perhaps sometimes the younger coach that can relate to the players in a different way might be the answer. I'm not sitting there saying Paul Chris didn't relate to his players. He had a remarkable – I just gave you that record. He just won 72% of his games. But – Now's the opportunity. And I want to give you uh, Wisconsin's schedule for, for Jim Leonard. And it's pretty favorable. They got through the tough part of their schedule. Uh, Ohio State, I don't think Illinois would be a tough game for them. They've got at Northwestern this weekend, which is Leonard's first game as interim. They've got Michigan State the following week. They've got Purdue, a bye week, and then Maryland. So those next four games with the talent in Braylon Allen at running back, uh, with the quarterback and Graham Mertz, who, who's, who's been shaky this year. It's a good moment if you're Wisconsin to make them move. I was 
surprised that it happened so quickly. I had been hearing rumblings that Paul Chris could be out. But unfortunately, this is a trend we're seeing in college football. We've already seen it this year, and I'm going to miss somebody. Carl Durrell, Paul Chris, the most recent. Herm Edwards, Arizona State. Uh, the big one early on was Scott Frost at Nebraska. Uh, Jeff Collins at Georgia Tech. He's another guy that was let go. So now that these ADs are saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make the move in season. We're going to see if we can catch any juice with the interim guy and if he can earn the job. We're also going to get ahead of the curve with potential candidates that we're going to talk to, to where maybe we'll name a guy in November to start recruiting while the interim's in place. And so Paul Christ at Wisconsin, this is a tough one because he played his ball there. He's from Madison. And when you bring your native son home, and look what's happened twice. Scott Frost and Paul Chris both fit this bill. They both played football at the school they coached. When you have that press conference, it wins the press conference. We're bringing one of our home. We our own guy's here. He's got it. He understands what it takes. Those sometimes are the hardest divorces to uh, deal with because you are. You're, you're saying goodbye to one of your own. So there was another coaching fire this week. Paul Christ out. Jim Leonard in for now to see if the Wisconsin Badgers can get anything going. Because I'll tell you this, as far as coveted jobs, Wisconsin's going to be it. The Big Ten West is very winnable. You can recruit pretty well there. They've got a good history of offensive linemen and running backs. We'll see what Jim Leonard can do. So that a bit of a news uh, news dump here on the week six preview that Paul Christ is out. Same with Carl Durrell and two more coaching jobs are in. So that'll do it for the week six preview. Again, Come Sunday, bloody Sunday, and Paul Feinbaum, we're going to be able to say, you know what? We got to know Team X, Y, and Z, and that will really set the pace for the rest of October as we embark on the second half of the college football season. As always, we appreciate the listen. ESPN CFB YouTube channel will be here every week with previews and reviews of the college football week. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.